Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger. Hey. And Brian Broom. Yo. We're working on saying hello this week. It's great. We're uh, today, learning. We're learning. This is, yeah. This is what happens when you get on a podcast with two teachers. Lots of new rituals always coming through. Speaking of rituals... <laughs> Uh, We're talking today about witchcraft um, and rebellion, especially in the life of Saul. Uh, Greg reminded me again that we are still towards the beginning of Saul's reign. This is not (laughs) at the end, Um, but there's there's, uh, foreshadowing, very heavy foreshadowing here um, that we will get to later because spoilers. Um, But what is this connection between rebellion and witchcraft? Tell us the story, Greg. Yes, I was about to say, therein lies the story. (laughs) <laughs> We're in 1 Samuel 15, and I'm going to sum up a good deal, but I'll read a little bit. Saul has already forfeited the throne, but in principle, God hasn't taken it away from him yet. And he sends, God sends Samuel with a message. It's this. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, cattle and ass. The um, word for destroy is the Hebrew word karim, harim, which means to place under the ban or a um, little more explanation, to, to give something holy to God. And if it's something that can bear the fires, like gold or silver or bronze vase or something, it literally was passed through the fire, then would go to the temple treasury. But in most cases, it means destroy it completely. Don't take anything from it because God has claimed all of it. So if you take anything, you're committing sacrilege. And this ties in nicely, I think, with what we were talking about. I guess it was the last week, the whole idea of that which is sacred and holy and set apart to God, and uh, what happens if you mess with that. And Saul had messed with that previously with regard to offering sacrifices when it was none of his business. This, at first glance, looks more like a kingly job. It's it's take the sword and whack people, kill people. Mm -hmm. Now, if you haven't read the rest of the Bible to this point, this may may seem to come out of nowhere. But if we were to go back to Exodus 17, we find that when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, were on their way to Sinai, this desert tribe called Amalek, apparently descended from Esau, came and attacked their rear quarters, so the weak, the feeble, those who were kind of straggling behind. And for the first time then we meet Joshua, God tells Moses to send Joshua out in the field, leading an army of recently escaped slaves to take on these people. And this is the story the when I say story, historical event, when Moses goes up on high, sits on a rock, and Aaron or her hold up his hands as long as his hands are up. Uh, Israel wins when his hands drop. Israel loses. And Joshua, who, as I say, we have met for the first time, leads a successful victory under the watchful eye of Moses. And at the end of this, God tells Moses, call Joshua and write this down in a book and rehearse it in his ears. I will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. So God sets them off already way back then as utter enemies, um, a a people he will ultimately destroy completely. Now, my, I will say speculation, guess, is because it would seem kind of obvious that with Egypt completely laid low and having been repulsed by Israel, the obvious direction for Amalek to go would have been into Egypt, where they could take over without a fight and would stay there. Since Israel was not supposed to go back into Egypt, God had to defer, uh, or in his plan, he did defer, uh, the destruction of Amalek for quite a while. And Israel's been kind of busy with its its own problems. And we've run into Amalek here and there as mercenaries uh, working for other other nations. So they, they've continued to be a pain. So... Uh, at this point, if that's what happened, they've been expelled from Egypt, they're out in the open, and God says, all right, let's get this done. I registered their death sentence a long time ago. Go execute it. And if anyone has trouble with this idea of God executing the wicked, 
you can go back and listen to our podcast on the conquest where we address mm -hmm. some of these issues. That's not what we're going to talk about right now. But it's, thank you for going through the history of the Amalekites specifically, because I think it's so easy to read the Old Testament and just sort of blur everything together in our minds and say, well, there's Israel and then there's everybody else, which on a level is true, but mm -hmm. these are specific people groups as well. And there's a lot more to draw out of this if we can keep all the different enemy tribes straight. Yeah, mm. because there there is a time when God is laying down citizenship rules for immigrants, mm -hmm. and Egyptians and Edomites are allowed to become citizens of the third generation, Moab and Ammon not, and Amalek, on the other hand, is, and you will completely wipe out their memory from under the earth, or under heaven. So, yeah, God, and then there was Tyre and Sidon, who, who were originally on the kill list, and yet eventually they're converted, at least briefly. To be an enemy of God can mean lots of things. Largely, it means you're on your way to hell. But it doesn't necessarily mean that God's not going to come after you with a saving grace, or that God may not give you more time, or that you're at the top of God's hit list at the moment. But Amalek was at this point, and Saul knew that. He was told, don't bring anything back. It's all God's. It's all under the ban. Just do this. And it, in some ways, it should have been easy. He went, and he was very successful in his battle. He won the battle without any difficulty. And he killed a lot of the stuff, but he brought back the best of the sheep and the oxen. And he brought back the king, Agag, mm. to uh, do a little triumphal parade into Israel. And as he comes back, Samuel goes out to meet him and immediately, as before, at a distance, realizes something's not right here. Samuel, or Saul sees him and says, Blessed art thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> Bold claim. <laughs> Bold claim. And Samuel, as is his way, says, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, buddy. What's going on here? Oh, those? <laughs> those That's those. like when you ask your child. It's like, well, <laughs> what happened here? And it's like, I was just minding my own business. Well, you're holding a bat and the vase is broken. So I don't <laughs> think that's correct. <laughs> Or you're asking about the cookies and with chocolate all over his fingers and mouth. I don't know about cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I turned it in, Mrs. Maxson. Well, then why isn't it in my tray? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're good at that. There's it. clearly something happening with the space-time continuum. <laughs> and that paper in particular just, just vanished. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, suddenly I remind, as, as we describe humanity, that sent me back to Eden. Yeah, <laughs> why? What, what's going on? I heard your voice and I was afraid because you're scary and a bully. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, she gave it to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and in fact, that's very relevant here because mm -hmm. Saul says, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. Um, yeah, we, we've seen before that Saul is a new Adam in this new garden, Canaan. And he, is, he has begun a series of falls. He um, mm. has sinned against um, God rather directly. Uh, in the chapter we skipped over, he sinned against Jonathan his son, his brother in the faith. And here he is sinning in the context of the wider watching world. He is supposed to have destroyed God's enemies out there, but instead he's compromised for personal pride and glory. But his first, first shift is the people you gave to be with me. Just as Adam blamed his wife, Saul blames the people. And then he even tries to con he, he tries to bring God and Samuel in on blame by saying they brought them to sacrifice to the Lord thy God. Well, you know, you're always so big about this sacrificing to God thing. So they just took that as, as something that would be okay. You know, they don't know the faith very well and their intentions were good. They're basically good in there someplace. There's some good in them. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, they're, they're, they they want to do the religious thing, so they were doing the religious thing. And um, I'm sure it's fine, right? Couldn't be. I mean, how bad could this? Because we did, we did destroy everything else like we were supposed to, but, you know, people couldn't control them. Same that, that's an interesting tack to take, too, if you're like, well, I couldn't control the people. Normally, people without control will murder everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's claiming, oh, look, we brought these here to sacrifice them to the, to the Lord. They were supposed to be a sacrificial type on the battlefield. Yeah. And in their you know cities where the, the sheep and oxen and everything were. But in, instead, there's like this falling back his excuse is like well there's the forms and the traditions that we mm -hmm. have to do we we have to bring them here because that's where things like that happen yes. even though god told me to do it elsewhere i, I this is uh. this is the way we do it <laughs> This is the way. <laughs> I remember using this exact strategy as a kid, though, too. Like, oh, yeah, I ate my green beans, just not all of them. <laughs> it's like, technically, I followed the rule. No, that's not following the rule. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Samuel says, um, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. Say on. And, and he recounts how Saul, when he started out, was humble a little in his own sight, and God, the Lord sent him on a task. And the, I understand the Hebrew where it says a journey, a, a little trip. This was not a big deal. This was not World War Three. This was something easily handled. And in, in fact, Saul's victory shows that it was. And said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight till you've consumed them. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And, and listen to, to Samuel's response. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord thy God in Gilgal. What? <laughs> yes. So in other words, you didn't do the thing that you just said you did. Yeah, he contradicts himself in the same sentence. Well, no, I did exactly what God commanded, except for the parts where I didn't. I, I brought back Agag, but have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. You mean except Agag. Uh, but the people, how about this other stuff? The people, they took it. Again, he's blaming the people. Wonderful covenant representative you've got here, Israel. But you know what? You wanted one, you got one. Uh, as for the animals, uh, the people took the spoil. Things that should, and he admits they should have been utterly destroyed. But again, they're going to be sacrificed to the Lord thy God. Brian was talking about. So yeah, this the, the, the self contradictoriness of this is just amazing. And so Samuel just kind of blows the whistle. Says, All right, wait. And, and we begin the passage we want to talk about. Samuel says, Half the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And again, he doesn't lose the throne immediately. And he, he does finally admit, I've sinned. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He's still making excuses. Uh, but he, but he does, Sam is going to leave and, and Saul ask him to stay and support him before the people. I've sinned, yet honor me now. But in the process, as Samuel turns, Saul um, grabs his robe and it tears. Samuel turns and says, the Lord hath torn the kingdom of Israel away from you and given it to a neighbor of thine that's better than thou. For the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. He's not a man that he should repent. I've sinned. Honor me before the people. So they they go and they worship, uh, presumably not using the animals that Saul brought back, 
because they were already God. So to take God's stuff and then give it back to God a second time would be out of, bad. Out of curiosity, um, Samuel tells Saul that the kingdom has been torn from your hands and it will be given to a neighbor. I don't recall offhand which tribe Saul is from. Mm. He's from Benjamin. 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 Yes. Isn't that neighboring to David's tribe? Oh, yes, it is indeed. (laughs) Right next door. There we go. Yeah. So, well, at this point, Samuel calls for Agag. And I love this bit. Agag came unto him delicately. (laughs) (laughs) Mincing and dancing as he goes, I guess. I don't know. And he says, surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel says in so many words, want to bet. And (laughs) takes a sword and hews him in pieces before the Lord. And then that sets us in line in the next chapter for the calling of David, even before the whole Goliath incident. So there's the story, the historical details. But we want to fasten on this rebellion as a sin of witchcraft. We're combining what is, in essence, the second and perhaps the third commandment with, I suppose, the fifth. The the second, third commandment address witchcraft, which is an attempt to force God to do your will or to look at it differently, to ignore the channels of command, the channels of authority that God has ordained, and to try to assert your will over reality rather than submit to the people God has put over you and particularly those who speak to you his word. Mm. So that's that's where these things are coming together. It is um, the second point of of covenant theology, that of representation. Will you recognize that God has put people in your life who have the word of God and who speak it into your lives, whether it be parents or church officers or civil officers? Um, Or will you insist on having your own way, even to the point of trying to blackmail God himself, twist God's power back on him uh, Mm. to get your own way? Rebellion is just the sin of witchcraft. They they are both of the same nature. We will not have this man to rule over us. And that if that means trying to thwart God by earthly means, that's fine with us. Well, it's called magic. It's called witchcraft or divination. Um, a note about divination, and this is something that I've only become clear on of late. We tend to think of divination, fortune telling, as looking at possibly, it's probably the influence of Newtonian science and also of late of um, uh, various genres of science fiction. We tend to look at the timeline as an established thing flowing into the future, mm-hmm. and we it's already kind of set there, and we look in we look down the corridors of time and see what's going to happen and tell people. That's fortunate. Yeah, that's like the Norse perspective, too, yeah. of destiny and fate cannot be overruled. Right. Mm-hmm. But it seems that in, more generally in the ancient world, diviners were thought when they saw the future to freeze the future. Um, when Balaam is hired to curse Israel, the idea is not obviously to um, to try to tinker with an existing reality, but to alter reality. Obviously, God is on the side of these people. We want you to change that by your prophesy. Mm-hmm. Not not just look into the future and see what's going to happen. They already knew what was going to happen. It wasn't happy for them, but they hope that his divination could alter the future in that direction. So when we're talking about witchcraft, and I think the translation is a good one in that sense, although you might you might opt for divine or divination, but magic or witchcraft is good in the sense that for us, those words more clearly convey you're trying to change the future. You're not accepting what God has decreed, what God has revealed, what God has prophesied. You're trying to do an anti-prophecy. You're trying to twist the timeline. Uh, in a direction more favorable to yourself and defy God's eternal decrees or pretend they don't exist as such. God may have a plan, but there are things within earth that can alter that plan, that can force his hand, turn his power back on itself, give you what you want. Uh, This is a good time then to, having defined witchcraft in this way, um, sort of on the side address um, an abuse of this text um, I'm thinking of the the Gothardites and the oh yes umbrella 
picture that we've all seen <laughs> that sort of uses witchcraft as just the stand-in for scariness, that you don't want to be on the side of witches, do you? Witches are scary, therefore never question to those everyone. above you. Yeah. Okay, well, see, I escaped all of that. <laughs> um, I was never exposed to that. I know that even in our school, in its early days, we have used that. My wife more than once has said, we're, getting, we're making sure that none of that's left. <laughs> uh, so I don't know exactly what form that took. Uh, could you could you maybe expand on that a little bit as to what how you've perceived it before? Uh, well, I thankfully was also sheltered from it. It's not something that I experienced firsthand, but a lot of my friends grew up mm -hmm. in those circles uh, where any questioning of your parents, well, so, so there's this image that you may have seen or may not have seen that's this, the big umbrella is mm -hmm. the father. Under that, there's a smaller umbrella that's the mother. And then under that is the kids. Mm -hmm. And um, actually over all of that is another one that's Jesus. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And above the umbrella is the rain coming down and the rain is labeled sorcery. And really? I have never yes. heard this before. <laughs> Um, and it almost gives you the impression that, you know, Jesus umbrella isn't good enough. You need another one under your <laughs> That's um, That's typically how I argue against this as an image. It's like, do, do your umbrellas have holes in them? Yeah, yeah it's more of a parasol, really. Um, <laughs> but the the idea is to really hammer this idea of if you disobey, you are outside of God's blessing, you are outside of you, you've placed yourself under the realm of the devil. And it's it's more of a scare tactic than any sort of biblical statement about authority. Uh -huh. And uh, it also heavily implies that, you know, fathers are impervious to the buckets of sorcery raining, raining down, and they can't ever be wrong. Which again yes. is kind of a scare tactic. <laughs> like no. Yeah. Don't question. Don't question. Just just obey. And it's been used to support a lot of abuses from my understanding. Yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind in hearing, and I've never heard it explained that way before, would be, well, for instance, here, Saul is a civil leader. He's the king. He's the one who falls into magic. Right. <laughs> and as you look at the rest of the Bible, the people who more often than not are pursuing it are false prophets and apostate priests. They are authority figures mm -hmm. who get the, who get full of themselves and think that they can do no wrong and that they are the right hand of God. So the people yeah. under them should be questioning them. Yeah, and should be exactly looking at that God. point. This is the point where you need to be holding your authority figures accountable and there's nothing now obviously you don't need the smart alley key kid saying right. well show me from the bible i don't believe you there are waiting father can you can you explain can you, can you explain this from scripture i i'm not seeing the connection you can do it politely mm -hmm. uh, with respect but you can do it and uh, for instance I'm, I'm thinking here of the church of berea which wasn't mm -hmm. a church yet it was a synagogue and Paul comes and preaches, and we're told that the Bereans were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica, and that they searched the word of God day and night to see whether or not these things were true. And because they did, many believed. Uh, Luke calls them more noble because they took on an inspired apostle and made sure that what he was saying was in harmony with Scripture. Mm -hmm. Paul does not say, I am an apostle, I speak for God, don't you dare question me. He turns it back on the Bible. And in fact, Jesus does the same thing mm -hmm. when they start questioning him. Search the scriptures. Rather than you think they have life, mm -hmm. you're firmly persuaded you have life. And they could. But they are they that would testify of me. And so central to this whole idea of authority, and I think I said it each time, is we're talking about people who have the word of God. That's their authority. Their authority mm -hmm. is that they minister as delegated agents of God, the written word. And, and part of they, that authority is the responsibility to equip those in their charge. Oh yes, to Excellent. test them and hold Absolutely. them accountable and know the word of God. Absolutely, and far too often that doesn't happen. It's just yeah. sort of an, uh, an assumption of osmosis. You know, you've grown up in this Christian family, this Christian church. 
You've been in Sunday school. Of course you know the Bible. Well, my experience <laughs> teaching in a Christian school now for many, many years is that's a really bad assumption. Uh, even after kids have been through Sunday school or catechism class or whatever happens in, in your particular tradition, that's no guarantee. And it certainly doesn't, if you send your kid to public school on top of that, that sure doesn't counteract what they're hearing on an ongoing basis from school, from media, you know, from their friends, from everything else. It takes dedicated time to teach your children the Word of God. And, and even trusting, testing that, trusting Christian schools to do it. We have limited time and we can't talk about everything because unless you have a church school where you have your own people and your own tradition who can go into your confession in detail, there's going to be holes. I've experienced that myself a bit with my own kids. Like, oh, I probably should have spent more time talking to you about that one. Oh, well. <laughs> well late now. We learn from our mistakes. Hopefully we learn. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, well, it's also interesting, too, that you speaking about authority is said, yes, Jesus was, or is, sorry, but in his earthly ministry specifically was like the ultimate authority. He was yeah. God in flesh. And even when he is tempted by Satan himself, he still goes, here's a Bible verse for you. Yeah. Here's another Bible <laughs> yeah. verse for you. Here's an, I, I read an interesting uh, theory. I don't remember who they quoted this holding to it, but it was a very interesting concept that in that, the thought was Satan didn't know who the Messiah was himself. Mm -hmm. And part of it was also Satan, like giving little, little testing parries to see, is this really the guy? Is this the guy yeah. that that's been promised to crush my head? You know, that kind of thing. Right. And each time Jesus doesn't answer directly. He doesn't let the, the temptations of the, um, you know, the proofs of, right. you know, the, the angels, they, it said that the Messiah will be protected by angels, that even, even your foot will be kept from scraping a stone. And he just goes, don't test the Lord, your God. <laughs> <laughs> and Satan just kind of goes like, ah, I thought I had him on that one. <laughs> um, speaking of our Lord, that reminds me too of the centurion who uh, asked Jesus to come and heal his, his servant. And uh, when Jesus starts, he sends more friends to say, no, I didn't mean you had to come. <laughs> yeah. Just speak a word. I, because he says, I also am a man under authority. Mm. Uh, he worked for Caesar. And therefore, I send, I tell this guy, do this. He does it. I say, this guy, go here. He goes. And the implication being, you are in total submission to God. And therefore, you have total authority. Because you are wholly submitted to your Heavenly Father. And therefore, your word is law. So let's not mess around here and let's not waste your time. Um, just, just say the word. I, I, I know how this works and from a Gentile. Um, and that was impressive. So, and again, we could fall back here on all of the, the pagan myths where the sons of daughters of God did rebel against their father. Cronus against Sheridan, Zeus against Cronus, uh, mm. Isis against Ra, Loki against Odin. You know, it's an ongoing theme that the begotten always turns on the begetter and tries to overthrow his authority and, and usurp it. And yet Jesus comes always saying, I do all of those things to please my father. I've come to do the work he gave me and to finish the work. And so there's no conflict within the Trinity. There's absolute harmony and mutual submission within the Trinity to accomplish what they have decreed. And it's written down. And once it's written down, they, Jesus is not get to say, you know, dad said that in olden days, but I got a better idea. <laughs> there, there is none of that. There's no dispensational generation gap. There is complete conformity. Mm. And, and know that God's people understood that better and tried to see the unity of scripture rather than, than some of the developing conflicts that are there because of sin and the slow process that God takes in dealing with sin. And we can look at the Old Testament and say, yeah, things were different there for reasons that are clear, but they're the same reasons that bring Christ into the world and the same reasons that we live the sort of Christian life and the sort of, sort of Christian existence we have now. God has not changed. God did not get smarter. He did not evolve into a higher ethical standard. One uh, liberal pagan said, the difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is God became a Christian. <laughs> That's a bottom of uh, the ball. Ouch. Well, I've one way I've always thought of the the, the different pagan pantheons. That's the word. Mm. I thought of the different pantheons as like 
you know, they they come into being because they had parent gods who right. themselves were children of chaotic nothingness. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that the pantheon as it is now exists, like this hedonistic, in the case of the Greeks, collection of, of deities, is because they all rebelled and killed the the first generation of gods that came from the kind of proto-god chaos soup, if you will. Right. And really, it just it's it's Satan's fan fiction. He's like, I <laughs> didn't get to do this, but I really want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is indeed Satan's worldview. It has to be. He awakes, is created, and finds himself praising God. And at some point, he's got to stop and say, you know, to the angel next to him, how long have we been doing this? Well, you know, just said, yeah, I know. Well, what was before that? Well, God was before that. How long? Well, you know, for for forever. And the world below? Well, God just created just before he created us. How do you know that? Because Satan awakes and God's there, but Satan awakes and the world's there. And below, as they look down on the world, there's a world ocean. How many myths begin with chaos, as you say, Mm -hmm. or out of the world coming, rising up out of water? That's and it's amazing Satan. how many people want to connect that with the without form and void in yeah. Genesis. The word chaos is not there. It's no, not it's the not. same thing. It's not at all the same thing. But that's I think I think you're I love the the, the fan fiction thing. Satan's writing himself uh, a new um, narrative, a meta narrative in this case, where this is what really happened. God woke up a little before us. He evolved out of the same stuff that we came out of. And he tried to pull this great con thing that he's some great super god. And he had his con for a little bit, but then we woke up and now we're trying to take him down. And as you say, it plays in all the all the pagan myths. It's an ongoing theme that that which was there first was not what was really there first. And the great gods must give way to the newer gods. So, you know, we keep, we keep finding ourselves. Once you deny the reality of Scripture, what the Bible actually says, there are only so many options. They all look an awful lot alike. <laughs> but now I would like to address something else. Going back to kind of, I guess, that umbrella idea you brought forward, because I think here is a point we have to be very careful with. And it's, in some ways, it's obvious and clear. In some ways, it's, it can become very slightly nuanced if you don't. You can say the same thing and mean two different things. <clears throat> Let's put it that way. <laughs> God blesses obedience. Yes, <laughs> he does. But what do you mean by that? If we, by our own choices in obedience, stay under this umbrella, then we earn God's blessing. No, that is not the gospel. That is not Christianity. That is works righteousness. That is, in essence, paganism and magic. We force God's hand by complying with this list of rules, by going through mm-hmm. particular ethical rituals, and sometimes just particular rituals, period, mm-hmm. we will capture God's blessing. Uh, there's a, there's a, a line from the Heidelberg Catechism, I don't know if I can quote it exactly, but it's something like this. Do our good works merit nothing, although it is God's pleasure to reward them in this life and in the world to come? And the answer is the reward comes not of merit, but of grace. And I, I think that's something we really need to be very clear on here. Mm-hmm. This, this whole thing, is, is Saul going to earn God's blessing by doing the things he's been told to do? No, he won't, because sin, God does not owe anybody any blessing ever, not under any circumstances. Uh, the only person he owes blessing to is his own son because of his love for him and because of the obedience his son accomplished in history. What we receive for being in Christ is the outpouring of that blessing for our good. Now, if we Not think in that, exchange for our good. No. For, for our, the purpose of our good. <laughs> for the purpose of our good. Yeah. And, the, and because it is for our ultimate good, not our momentary happiness... <laughs> That does not mean the blessing will always look like what we have been taught to think of blessing as. It doesn't mean we're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're going to have riches and and Subarus and Cadillacs and Learjets and 
I am, you know, 50 children and whatever, <laughs> it may mean we're in for a lot of suffering and persecution because that may be the blessing whereby God makes us holier. Mm -hmm. the, the ultimate blessing is to draw closer to God himself and to inherit God. Mm -hmm. uh, and God will do whatever it takes within the sphere of our earthly lives to accomplish that according to his plan. We don't even get to, we don't even get to specify the details. Lord, I would love to be more generous, so give me lots of money so I can be. <laughs> no, I think you need to be more poor so that you can learn humility and learn to ask other people to help you and be dependent upon them. Let's go that route, <laughs> shall we? And give uh, out of your poverty, even. And give out of your poverty, exactly. And, and so when we're talking about blessing here, God does delight to bless his children. The example I've used a um, number of times is, as my children were growing up, especially my firstborn, I wanted to give her a bike. Because, you know, dads do that. You buy bikes for your kids at a certain point. But that's, that's the thing at a certain point. Buying her a bike when she was two would be pointless because mm -hmm. she couldn't ride it. And she had to grow up. Did she have to grow up in, or in order to earn my love to get her a bicycle? No, she had to get to grow up so she could actually use the thing. <laughs> and and yeah. so are many of God's blessings. He he withholds blessings not because he does not love us and does not want to bless us because we're not ready for them yet. Some people would be horrible with a million dollars. And until they have learned to control their lusts and to be wise in their, their spending and their values, God's not going to give them a million dollars, which means many of us never get a million dollars. Because, God, again, God's vision is with the spiritual good, our own spiritual good, and our interaction with everybody else. Once we get a million dollars, what are we going to do with it? It's, I think both of you may remember one of the first assignment in our income kind of class is God gives you a million dollars, or now it's two million because of inflation. <laughs> what, what do you do with it? And the first class I ever had just tried spending it. <laughs> and they spent it on everything they could think of. And when they were done, they still had a million dollars left. And they were just kind of frustrated of, well, what are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> so we, we come, when we come to Christ, uh, there is nothing that he has not already purchased for us. There is nothing that is not ours by faith. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we, we can't earn it. We don't have to earn it. But God will appoint and apportion the blessings according to our needs for God's goal, which is our holiness and our fellowship with him. Hmm. Um, and so when we are walking in obedience, we will find that God may give us some nice earthly things. So because we're now in a point where we can use them profitably hmm. and because God delights us. And although our current happiness is not his highest priority, he enjoys seeing us happy. He just he has more important things than that. <laughs> Where does this idea of happiness come from, if not from God's own <laughs> yeah. happiness? God, God Himself, yeah. He made himself, it up. Yeah, He is ultimately all blessedness, all happiness. But we have to get there progressively on His terms. We have to be transformed yeah. by His Spirit yeah. from one on the terms to of another. His gospel, and it's the on rejection the of that that is really aligning ourselves with sorcery and witchcraft and i'm going to throw it to brian because he had cool thoughts on this yes sorry uh, that was a little bit of a sudden <laughs> oh it's fine sudden pivot. uh it, i've been thinking of it this whole time like how do i bring this in what's the connection point i was thinking um in our short little pre-recording conversation about rebellion and witchcraft and specifically um uh, how that is displayed for us in the book of revelation with the mark of the beast and if you're not aware of this connection the mark of the beast is the satanic counterfeit to a command given in the old testament let the law of the lord be as frontlets before your eyes that is little bits of paper with it written on it and as signs on your hand and well it's your forehead and your hand that the mark of the beast uh is said to go on in revelation and don't take me as saying that that is a literal mark. I don't hold to that. But anyway, <laughs> the mark of the beast is allegiance and loyalty to, in the immediate context anyway, a pagan kingdom, one that has specifically set itself up against God's reality. And it, in, in that sense, then, we find a synthesis of rebellion and witchcraft 
because there's nothing more witchcrafty than aligning yourself with Satan and the kingdoms that are under his control, so to speak. And there's God's side, and then there's God. Satan's side, and there's nothing in between. So when you rebel against God, there you are. <laughs> yes, but control makes it sound like Satan has some kind of say in them. Uh- <laughs> right. Well, I, I was just yeah, because yeah. like this is connecting back to what Saul did is that he's rejecting the authority of God. But sorry, continue. Exactly. So just contra dispensational anxiety <laughs> inducing theories. There isn't a single mark of the beast in favor of the anxiety inducing. There's a lot of marks of the beast and they've been <laughs> yeah. in various things in most countries, at least at one point in their history for all of human history, because there has always been a time where a nation, generally speaking, has rebelled against God. Mm-hmm. And in the extreme forms, we find things like Nazism or Stalinism or Maoism or emperor worship in uh, the Roman Empire, uh, which I believe is the initial, at least historical, referent for the Mark of the Beast, giving your pinch of incense to acknowledge uh, Caesar's authority over all, including uh, this this strange new Jewish sect that had popped up mm-hmm. in his empire. So the Mark of the Beast is the epitome of rebellious witchcraft. Yeah. No, that makes so much sense. I feel like over the last few years, you know, when I was growing up and starting to sort of think about Revelation, um, I say think about, not study, because I wasn't there <laughs> yet. But there was the Left Behind books were coming out, and there was a lot of hype. And there was a lot of, uh, yeah, the locusts are helicopters, and vaccines are the mark of the beast. Mm-hmm. And so then I was like, okay, so vaccines are not the mark of the beast. That's pretty obvious. And then we got to the last couple of years. And we're like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're not in themselves the mark of the beast, but there's a system here yeah. that is oppressing people. And and we'll, uh, we'll probably get taken off YouTube for this. Um, so we might have to cut this out. We'll, we'll see. We'll put the full version on Rumble. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, along those lines, uh, Revelation 13 is where you will find the, dis- the first lengthy discussion of the beast. It's not so much the beast that compels the mark as it is the, his crony, the false prophet, mm. which in in context, I'm, I'm going to, I don't know if this is exactly Brian's take on the book, but it's mine's. It seems to be somewhat similar to Brian's. If, if the beast uh, would initially be understood as the Roman Empire and the beast rises up out of the sea, the beast that comes out of the land that looks like a lamb would seem to be false religion or at least a false Israel taking on a role, an apostate role. There's two horns and it's emphasized. I, I would take one to be the Herods who are Israel, Rome's face in Israel, but the other one's got to be the high priests. And this, com- because they're, they're the ones who got in bed to, to murder Jesus. And these are the ones who in the land actually compel the mark. That is, when the power arises, it's all of the little crony friends who share the same worldview and who are gathering scraps at the beast's table. They're the ones who turn on you and say, well, you got to be on our side or you're not getting doing anything. You got to play by our rules. You got to submit to our way of doing things. And I don't know about you. I've never had a federal agent knock at my door, but our church and our school have had county agents knock at the door. And we've got a lot of flack from uh, co-religionists who say you can't be doing that because the government says no. It's it's not you know we're so afraid of the antichrist or the beast we forget about all the little support characters <laughs> right. who are more often the people we have to deal with those who themselves mm-hmm. have sold out their allegiance and are unable they they're so and, and I think this follows with what you're again back to the umbrella idea the state says this God tells us to obey the state therefore to defy the state is rebellion. Well, no, it's not that simple because the state too could be in, be in rebellion. And sometimes we have to call the state accountable to God's word. And that doesn't mean we go out and shoot people. Christianity is not revolutionary. It's not anarchistic. But it does have a good sense of everybody's accountable to somebody and everyone's accountable to God. Mm. 
And we can call the powers that be to account in terms of Scripture, and ought to. And, and again, not as lone, lone gunners for Jesus, but as part of covenant communities who are themselves submitted to one another and to the confessions and creeds of the church and so on. But the thing about this is it's not simplistic, and um, Americans like simplistic. They like the cowboy who charges in on his horse, pulls his gun, shoots people, and rides off into the sunset. No question of warrants, authority, anything. He solved the problem. Everything's happy. Vigilantes, from Superman to Batman to the Avengers. So do we sign the accords or not? To whom are we accountable? Captain America didn't want to be accountable to the UN. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. And he was the one who was like duly appointed by the US government to fight in wars. Yeah. So like he's the yeah. least vil- vigilante of all these characters. And he's like, no, you don't want to sign up for the UN. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be complicated and it can take some time to unwind and explain. And we want quick, easy solutions. And they're not always forthcoming. And sometimes we have to put up with a lot while our leaders work through things and try to figure out, okay, at what point do we draw a line and say, no, no further. This is contrary to the word of God. And we cannot, we, this we can do, this we cannot do and will not do. It's a hard thing. Mm-hmm. Well, in my studies, when I wrote the original article, I came across uh, um, something by R.A. Torrey. I don't know if you know R.A. Torrey. You probably, once I mentioned I know the his, name, but I can't yeah. think of where... Well, he was sort of a successor to Dwight Hill Moody. In mm-hmm. fact, he taught at oh, what that's would eventually become okay. Moody Bible College. And then it was suggested to him by somebody that he go out west and create something like that. And he went to Los Angeles and created a Bible Institute in Los Angeles, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, Biola. Oh, oh okay. hey. <laughs> I, I was not putting that together until you yeah, literally spelled it out I for me. Would but <laughs> uh, I, I think we would we would question some of Tory's theology, but he was he was a grand old man of the faith and did what he could of what he had, spoke around the world. It's part of the Keswick movement, so there's some problems there. But he certainly believed in inerrancy. Sorry, start he, of the what movement? Wait, the, yeah, what was he that? Was, he was part of the Keswick movement. That's a higher oh. life, deeper life. Oh, I've never heard that I've term. I've never before. heard that term. I've heard higher life, but I have no idea oh, what. Keswick? Okay. Well, okay. Keswick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he um, he was involved in writing the books that were called The Fundamentals, you know, the whole mm-hmm. fundamentalist movement. Mm-hmm. He was one of the, the, the leaders and shakers. So, um, a fundamentalist of the first order, serious about scripture. So, just that for what it's worth. He wrote something called the New Topical Textbook. He edited it, at least. And one of the sections is Rebellion. And I'm going to sum up, and I'm going to do it really quick. And if people really want to know, they can go back and play this slowly. But here are some things the Bible says about rebellion. And I want to give Tory credit for having saved me a lot of work. Rebellion provokes God and vexes his spirit. Number 1630, Isaiah 6310. Rebellion is exhibited in unbelief. Psalm 106, 24 through 25. In rejecting God's rule, 1 Samuel 8, 7. In despising his law and his counsels, Nehemiah 9, 26, Psalm 107, 11. In distrusting his power, Ezekiel 17, 15. In murmuring against him, Numbers 23 and 10. In refusing to listen to his word, Zechariah 7, 11. In rejection of God's appointed rulers, Joshua 1, 18. And in departing from the pattern and forms of worship that God has instituted, Exodus 32, 8 through 9. The rebel follows after his own thoughts rather than God's words, Isaiah 65, 2. Scripture associates rebellion with stubbornness, Deuteronomy 31, 27, injustice and corruption, Isaiah 1, 23, and contempt for God, Psalm 107, 11. Scripture is also graphic in describing the consequences of rebellion. God says, I will set my face against you, Leviticus 26, 17. You will be devoured by the sword, Isaiah 1, 20. I will pour out my fury upon them, Ezekiel 20, verse 8. I will cast thee from off the face of the earth, Jeremiah 28, 16. God is described as turning to be their enemy, and he fought against them, Isaiah 63, 10. In other words, God doesn't approve of them, of rebellion and unbelief. 
and going back again to the whole umbrella thing, it's, it's just my mind is still churning on that one. <laughs> uh, we need to distinguish in light of, of what Tori has summed up for us here. I, I think we have to be very clear in, dis in distinguishing between a sin, even a pattern of sin, and rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes only God can draw that line. Just because your kid back talks you once does not mean he is a rebel. Just because someone is struggling with one particular sin, uh, anger or lust or fill in the blank, does not necessarily mean that person is a rebel. He is rebelling against God's law at that point. But that does not necessarily ca characterize him as a rebel and therefore, well, son, you disobeyed me. So God has set his face against you. Be get ready to be devoured by the sword and God depart his fury upon you. No. <laughs> no. This nice. is where you point him back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The rebel is are those outside the camp altogether, not someone who has who has strayed in faith or grown weak in faith and slipped yep. into sin. This is somebody who... Well, as you say, has received the mark of the beast. They have consciously, self-consciously devoted themselves mm -hmm. to this principle of rebellion, of replacing yep. the God of Scripture with some earthly, worldly authority that they will serve, that they will worship, that they will imitate. With the knowledge that they were so choosing. And the knowledge that they were so choosing. Mm -hmm. It's not going to sneak up on you. No. You're not going to accidentally get the mark of the beast. You are going to be very aware that you have the mark of the beast. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you know, that is, you mentioned that, but again, in, in dispensational circles, that is something you encounter sometimes. Oh no, I did this. Did, did I receive the mark of the beast when I, you know, signed up for social got security? Or got the vaccine. No, yeah. no, <laughs> no. you didn't. Okay. No. There's a self-conscious rebellion here. Un uh, unless you literally said, I'm getting this because I love Satan. Or yeah. dis <laughs> yeah. disapprove of God because so Because I want much. to worship the state. Yeah, I, the state is my God and I will do whatever it says. At that point, you got a problem. And I think yeah. it's by, it probably was rather obvious to lots of people before that thing happened. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, Brian, the uh, I, I don't remember if you actually you said it explicitly. So I'm going to be explicit in case I missed something. But um, the, the mark on the, the forehead and the hand, the forehead or, as you said, more literally between the eyes, in other words, what you're, what's the filter through which you are seeing everything or the thing that's dominating your thinking? The front of your, your mind. Hand, in front of your and mind. And your and actions. Your, your actions, yeah, exactly. It's like where the where's the first place students think to write answers? Yeah. It's on their hand. That's the first place they're going to look. Oh, oh, we could have fun with that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And you shall not write upon your hand, lest you fall into the mark of the beast. Um, <laughs> what does it say? We can't write it ourselves right here. No, no, that's that's a joke. That's a very yes. bad joke. <laughs> anyway, one, and, and turning back to my original article, one last thing I do want to um, talk about as, as time is about to slip away from us. Mm -hmm. uh, falling back on what I understand of witchcraft, black magic, and the way it works, the sorcerer does not believe in a rational universe because rational universe points directly to God. And so the, the, the witch moves in an irrational world where anything is possible, where weirdness is a matter, a matter of course, it's just, that's, that's the way the world is. And although the demons they mess with may insist on very precise rituals and traditionally demons do, for instance, Roman religion, the religion of the family, uh, the father had to memorize the, the worship formulas, the table formulas, precisely from his father. And if they were not done exactly right, well, in theory, the demons could get very mad at you, even if those, even if the words had des descended into nonsense syllables, like abracadabra. You still had to do it exactly right, or the demons would get you. It's sort of the demons with their God complex of, well, God demands complete exact obedience, so we'll do the same. Ha, ha, ha. Watch them try to render it. Ha, ha, ha. But it's insane. It doesn't, the words mean nothing. The ritual movements mean nothing. It's, it's all a satanic mind game. But the, the witch, like the rebel, hates routine. It hates orderliness. It hates disciplined pattern. Whereas the Christian living in deliberately, self-consciously living in God's well-ordered universe submits to basic habits. Things like 
work six days in worship on the seventh. There, there are things that God has given us, such as the gift of habit and memory and muscle memory. You know, you can you can learn to play a piano to such a degree. I was just watching my my daughter play the piano last night, and she would turn and talk to her mom, right? And her fingers kept going. <laughs> You know, because it's there and, you know, we can type and talk to somebody. We can, we can dual process because habit has driven it into our very muscle memory. So we had to actually stop and remember how to tie a shoe, how to button a coat <laughs> or how to shift through multiple gears while listening to the radio and talking on our phone at the same time. The feelings <laughs> would be much more full of accidents than they are. But God has given us these wonderful gifts and we learn to submit to the patterns knowing that God is an orderly God and the universe he's created is an orderly universe. And by submission to habit and to pattern, to discipline, mm -hmm. we gain more control over our environments and we're more effective for the kingdom of God. The witch, the magician, on the other hand, the rebel, does not, does not like habits, does not like to be told it's time to do this. I don't care what time it is. I'll do it when I want to do it. I don't feel like doing it right now. And I want something big. I want it all at once. I don't want to build up to it by that discipline want, and practice. Yeah, I want I want to be able to immediately play the piano. I shouldn't have to work for it. I want I want it. <laughs> and so this is a, again a real point of conflict between a satanic worldview and a Christian worldview. The Christian worldview recognizes that we are creatures within a created universe that's bigger than we are, but is ruled by our heavenly Father for our good. And so if we submit to if we learn the patterns of the world he's made and submit to the patterns he has placed here. We're not submitting to an alien universe that we never made. We're submitting to our father's universe that he providentially governs. Mm -hmm. So we're submitting to God himself. We can become very, very effective, especially over time. As you say, the sorcerer wants everything right now without work, without discipline, and without really any rational explanation of why he should have it or how it should be there, his will should be sufficient. I mm -hmm. was just going to make that comparison. It's the will. Yeah. They live in a they they want to live in a universe. They don't live in a universe like this. They want to live in a universe that is it's I'm looking at snow out my window right now. They want it oh. to be a world where <laughs> if they willed the snowflake could become a ham sandwich before it hits the ground and land in their hand because they don't want to make a sandwich right now. Yeah. yeah. And this, you know, big theme of the podcast halting towards Zion. One little step at a time. One little that's, step at a time. And, that's how the and, not and not necessarily perfect steps. Yeah. They're kind of broken. I mean, yeah. That's that's the whole di idea behind the halting. Jacob limped. Mm -hmm. And limping is not the most effective way to get any place. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Not optimal. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter because we're not getting there by our own power. God has paved the way. God has ordained the way. God has empowered us for the way by his spirit through the blood of Christ. And so we can keep on keeping on. And if occasionally we slip and fall and land on our face, he picks us up and we keep going and we don't despair. Woe is me. The devil's in charge because I fell out of my face. <laughs> no, you're a sinner, but God's got you. As long as you keep looking at Jesus, the, the path will remain clear and you keep on keeping on. It just may take a lot longer than you want it to. Mm -hmm. There's that yeah. great line from Luther where he says, when the devil reminds me that I am a great sinner indeed, you need to respond to him. That's good because Jesus Christ died for sinners. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a couple of weeks <laughs> ago, I told sinner, you I was... I would have Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about jigsaw puzzles and how I feel yeah. like it's a sanctifying process for me. Yes. <laughs> it's this very idea that I keep thinking to myself, there has to be a better way to go about solving this. I'm not solving this jigsaw puzzle in the optimal way. And it just stresses me out. And then I'm like, this is literally the opposite of the point of doing a jigsaw puzzle. The point is to just do it one yeah. little piece at a time. Yeah. Um, and I thought of that because jigsaw puzzles were my recommendation a while ago. I think Brian has also recommended jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> but speaking have. of recommendations, we should give some before we sign off because we're way over time. Okay. Greg, do you want to <laughs> go first? I recommend tea. Oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> what kind are. of tea? Just tea? Earl Grey, hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I did not grow up drinking tea or coffee. And for years, I drank milk or water. 
but I went to England when I was about, oh, I don't remember, my late 20s, and uh, was introduced by the English to drinking proper tea. <laughs> and uh, ever, It's one of the rights that John Locke enumerates, right? Proper tea. Yes. Right, proper tea, yes. Life. Uh, <laughs> 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 proper tea is that. No, that's another joke. Anyway... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's calming. It's sitting. We're on COVID lock quarantine right now, and so we've all been pulling out the tea. And I went back to it after not having drunk it much of late. And it is so much nicer than coffee. Smooth, calming, <laughs> relaxing. Yeah. So oh, if you've wow. never tried tea before, now's a good time to try it. Coffee, if you have to have that jolt to get you up going in the morning, which I try not to do. But, you know, just relaxing and recovering and looking out the window. I wish I were there, Brian, and could see your snow because I like looking out at snow. But, oh. And I, I like I, coffee. I, oh, look, so. we're looking out a window. <laughs> oh, hey. Hey. Thanks for sharing, Brian. There is You're snow welcome. on the ground. Thank you. <laughs> That's neat. Um, yeah. So try some tea. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, that goes really well with my recommendation um, as I have just finished a mug of tea. Although I really like coffee, so I will fight you on that one. <laughs> but I am drinking this tea out of a mug that is way more fancy than a mug has any right to be. Um, mm. This is called the Ember Mug. And uh, this one was a gift to David. But what it does is it connects to your phone. What? And you can tell it on an app on your phone how hot you want your drink to be and remain. <laughs> and so for hours, it will stay at your ideal temperature. <laughs> and this was this the perfect like gift for David because he's constantly like he has this very narrow window of temperatures that are comfortable for him to drink. And by the time it's got there, he has like five minutes before it's too cold. <laughs> and he's, of course, very distracted and working all day. So this... This mug is his favorite thing. And since he has it, I also drink out of it and enjoy it. So this is called the <laughs> Ember Mug. They have it in a couple different sizes and they have a travel version, but it's it's ridiculous. And I didn't want to love it, but I do. <laughs> yeah. This seems like just the kind of first world comfort that you would despise on principle, but in <laughs> practice love. Exactly. It's it's a niche. And I I meant that you as in you particularly, but oh. it's also a general you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Guilty. <laughs> yep. For my recommendation, I'm going to recommend two things, and they are in my house with my wife. Things that happen concurrently. And that is in the mornings, we drink a full cup of water and a smaller mug that is full of all the hot toddy ingredients except for Ooh. cinnamon and bourbon. Nice. Uh, so, so like apple cider and, kind of stuff? No, just water, oh, honey, okay. and uh, lemon juice. And hot water, that is. Okay. And it's very delightful in the morning. It like just It's just a nice little thing to have. My wife has coffee mm -hmm. as well. I don't typically drink anything caffeinated in the mornings because I don't like it in the morning <laughs> as much for, for whatever reason. It's just not me. Uh, but then the second thing is it's, I'm pretty sure this is something I've recommended before, but I am going to recommend uh, daily morning devotions mm. specifically with uh, whoever is in your immediate family as a member. So me and my wife, and then the dogs are just there. They don't, <laughs> but we, it's been, know. it's been really lovely. I did not grow up in a family that did any kind of devotion as a family. So it's very, Nice. I, this is something I 100% recommend. You should be doing this with your family because it, it leads to great conversations. Multiple times we read something and we'll spark like a, a two or three minute sidebar where we just talk about that or uh, in our less sanctified moments, complain about people who don't do the thing that we just read. Um, so uh, hot lemon honey water. And a full cup of water because you need to hydrate. Hydrate. And then yeah. daily devotions. So I recommend that. Awesome. Great recommendations. All right. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband and favorite mug owner. 
that is the owner of my favorite mug as well as my favorite <laughs> owner of a mug. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Um, and if you want to reach out to us for any reason, send us a question, a comment, an insult, um, you can email halting towards Zion at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Rumble. Uh, we'll let you know if the YouTube censors get to us. That's, that's a joke, I hope. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>